and um, let's go ahead. Okay. Sounds good. Eh, okay. Eh, buenos días a todos. El día de hoy en charlas de economía contamos con la presencia de Cruz Nudo. Eh, Cruz es profesor en la Escuela de Geografía y, y Guerra, Environment, Ambiente y Sociedad de la Universidad McMaster en Hamilton, Ontario. Eh, Cruz es doctor en Geografía de la Universidad de McMaster eh, y ha sido profesor en la Universidad de Illinois en Montana Champaign. Eh, antes de retornar a McMaster, él es, eh, él es un representante bastante importante en la Asociación de Ciencias Regionales de Norteamérica y en la Asociación Canadiense de Ciencias Regionales. Y ha publicado en temas de salud, migración, transporte y, y pues hoy nos trae un trabajo está desarrollando en temas de migración y capital humano. Bruce, uh, thank you for being here. And, uh, and please uh, go ahead if you, can, if you want to uh, share your screen right now. All right. Thanks very much, Juan. Um, and it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, there we go. If, um, if there's questions, of course, uh, feel free to, uh, you know, ask or put them into uh, the chat. I guess I don't see that immediately. So Juan, if there are questions that come up, uh, just let me know and uh, pass them along. So as, as Juan said, uh, I'm a professor at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. And uh, I'd like to speak to you today about human capital and short-term uh, migrations. And I'll um, take you through uh, what I mean by this. I'll spend some time just talking about the context and drivers of short-term relocations, get to the purpose, data and methods, um, some evidence uh, for this and pulling upon both descriptive and multivariate analysis and then uh, the conclusions. So to set this up, um, I was flying out west, this was of course pre-COVID, and flying out to uh, one of the western provinces here in Canada. And the person that I was sitting beside on the plane had uh, driven from his home in St. Thomas, Ontario to Hamilton, uh, where the airport is, and that was a time of about uh, a one and a half hour drive for him. He was then boarding the plane, flying from Ham Hamilton uh, to Calgary, Alberta, which was a four hour flight. Um, and then flying from Calgary, Alberta to Fort McMurray, Alberta, which is another hour and a half flight. And Fort McMurray, Alberta is, is sort of the central site for uh, Canada's oil sands production. So there's a number of very large petrochemical factories and plants or production facilities uh, at that location. And then once arriving in Fort McMurray, he would um, report to work uh, and he would typically work for one or two weeks on. Um, so extended work days, probably 12 hour work days, 12 hours off, um, but then would return home that one or two weeks later um, and then repeat that cycle, probably spending a few days at home before flying or returning back out west to continue his work at Fort McMurray. Um, so this is this idea of, you know, long distance commuting or um, interprovincial uh, work that I'll be talking about today. So key definition then are these interprovincial employees or IPEs, and these are individuals who work in one region, so at say the provincial level and reside in another. And I'll be talking a lot about interprovincial, so across provincial boundary movement, um, as well as looking at some smaller regions within this. Now, um, this idea or this definition of interprovincial employees includes um, daily movement as well as longer distance movement. So that longer distance movement, that would be the example that I just showed you of the person flying and working out west. They're not doing that daily, 
but maybe on a week, two, three week cycle. Um, but it also is going to include people who do commute uh, or move across a provincial boundary on a daily basis. So from Gatineau, Quebec to Ottawa, Ontario. And um, just to give you a sense, provincial map, we're not looking at the three Northern Territories, Yukon, Northwest Territories and Nunavut, um, but all of the provinces sort of along the Southern half of um, Canada. And so McMaster is located about here in Ontario and that person was flying from Hamilton or actually would have lived down here. Uh, and I'm assuming you can see my cursor um, and flying to uh, Northern Alberta uh, here, uh, for example. Um, those daily commutes, so this is an example where people would be commuting from Gatineau, Quebec to Ottawa, Ontario. And, and Gatineau and Ottawa, that's part of the national capital region. And so you have a lot of cross provincial border movement of these individuals uh, going from one province to another just daily to work typically in, in government offices. So we have to remember that these interprovincial employees do include these people that are making these very short distance. My real interest is in terms of the long distance uh, migrants and we'll be spending a lot of time talking about those. We can contrast these interprovincial employees with interprovincial migrants or IPMs and these are individuals who permanently relocate from one province to another. Um, so again, just continuing in terms of um, the context and drivers, uh, over the past few decades, we've seen declining interprovincial migration rates. So people making permanent relocations across space. In 1972, that interprovincial migration rate was about 1.78%, that it declined to about 0.73% by 2013, and has you know continued to decline just slightly um, since then. And why is that? Part of it is Canada's aging population. We know that as people get older, they're less likely to migrate and less likely to migrate over long distance. Um, we've also seen since the 1970s and even before that, um, increased female labor force participation in dual learner households. So that makes it harder, of course, to relocate a household um, when both people are earning an income um, a long distance migration often interrupts somebody's income stream. So people are less willing to engage in long distance migration when there are two people working of it, in it. And we've also seen evidence, not just here in Canada, but also in the US, that there's reduced benefits to long distance migration. So the, the benefits that we usually gave to long distance migration of um, higher income, better wage um, or, or better employment outcomes, better job matching. Um, we don't see that as much or those benefits aren't there in the same way uh, these days. Um, but the interesting thing is that the employment and income opportunities remain. So even as interprovincial migration has declined or that migration rate has declined, um, the employment opportunities across the country um, and the income opportunities uh, remain. So we see, for example, this regional mismatch in labor availability. And this is a long running problem that we see in Canada, uh, where we have typically high unemployment in the eastern provinces, say along or near the Atlantic Ocean, and low unemployment in the western provinces like Alberta or British Columbia. And part of that has been driven by uh, the resource sector in Western Canada and its growth. And uh, so with those labor demands and high incomes associated with it, whereas in Eastern Canada, uh, much more reliant on traditional industries like fishing and forestry and farming, for example. Uh, so lower income, more seasonal type of uh, employment opportunities. Um, so declining interprovincial migration rates and numbers, the demand for labor or that regional mismatch remains. Uh, so what we've seen instead is an increase in these interprovincial employees or IPEs 
over that same period. And the thinking is, is that these interprovincial employees don't need to fully invest in migration. They're not giving up, for example, their home. They're not moving away from places where their partner is working. They're not moving away from places where their children go to school. So one person from the household goes and works, but they don't, they're not investing in that migration. Um, so for example, this is, you know, reinforcing this idea that interprovincial employees have been increasing. And then this is just a, a small snapshot. The blue bars here are the number of, of interprovincial employees. It was increasing through 2008, a bit of a decline post-recession. Um, and then it would have continued to grow and interprovincial migrants uh, in the red line here. So again, the number of interprovincial employees exceeding that of interprovincial migrants. Um, we saw that increase through, or we think through about 2014, um, but then 2014, we saw declines in that oil and resource sector, decreased investment in the oil sector. And that was in part, what was driving a lot of that interprovincial employee movement into the Western provinces was that engagement or work in the oil and resource sector. Um, 2014, the um, you know, oil sector globally um, declined and the price of oil declined substantially. Um, so in the Canadian context and in most other cases, um, you, we saw a decreased exploration, lower commodity prices, increased automation and production and exploration. Uh, and reduce construction of new facilities. So that potentially meant the need for, or reduced need for both interprovincial employees and interprovincial migrants. Um, just some examples there, you know, so Statistics Canada, for example, reported a net loss of 32, just over 32,000 jobs in the mining, quarrying, and oil and gas extraction sector between 2014 and 2017. And then that support sector shed uh, over 24,000 jobs over the same period. So the support sector to the oil and gas sector or the mining sector, for example. And uh, labor projections suggested that employment would not return to pre-2014 levels, that it's employment in the oil and gas sector or the mining sector, for example, and it certainly hasn't. Um, you know, we've continued to see lower employment levels um, in the resource sector than what we saw prior to 2014. So that gets me to uh, the purpose of what I'm talking about today to explore the characteristics of interprovincial employees, to explore changes in the pattern and uh, patterns and characteristics of interprovincial employees between 2011 and 2016, and asking the question did the downturn in 2014? in the oil and gas sector or the, the resource sector more broadly have an impact on the number and rate of interprovincial employees. And um, then also just to give you a sense of sort of how important this um, movement of interprovincial employees is, and that's to take a look at the transfer of income across space. Um, so in terms of data and methods, there's two uh, files that I'm working with here, uh, both from Statistics Canada. Uh, so both are nationally representative. Um, so one is the 2011 National Household Survey and the second being the 2016 Census. Um, you know, for um, sort of those that are interested in, in data and files, um, the Canadian government technically did not do the census in 2011. Um, and defined it instead as a national household survey, which changed some of the sampling procedures um, and the requirement for response associated with it. It's still a good survey, but there's some problems that uh, in particular instances, uh, for example, it didn't or typically meant that people at the very low end of the income spectrum and the very high end of the income spectrum didn't respond. Uh, in the same way. Uh, it also meant that 
um, statistics at small geographic scales were compromised, were not as good as what we typically see with the 2016 census. But at the scale that I'm looking at here, the provincial or regional scales, the counts and the numbers are still quite reliable. Um, so we're using those as two different data points in time. And we're focused on non-institutionalized workers and the labor force who are aged 15 to 64 and who reported paid income or paid employment in the year preceding or leading up to uh, the census, so in 2010 and 2015. And we'll compare interprovincial employees and interprovincial migrants uh, by using measures that are commonly used to describe migration. So descriptive measures, and we'll do this at the, the provincial and the region um, scale. And really when I first sort of did some work related to interprovincial employees, uh, I was really curious to see whether or not their characteristics were different than interprovincial migrants. Um, and if so, in, in what way were they different? So just in terms of some definitions, stayers, uh, those are individuals who did not move, had the same province of residence and, and work in 2010 and 2011 or 2015, 16. Interprovincial employees defined those already. So individuals who are, are resident, resident in one province in 2011 or 2016, but who reported a place of work in another province and interprovincial migrants. So those whose province of residence five years prior to the census, say 2011, um, differs from um, their place of residence in 2016. Okay, uh, or sorry, one year prior to the census, I should say. Um, so just in terms of overall results, and remember, we're expecting that 2015 to 2016 period because of the um, decrease in terms of the oil and gas sector or resource sector more broadly, we're probably going to see um, fewer migrants and fewer interprovincial employees. Not the case in terms of um, migrants. Uh, there's actually more migrants in 2015-16 than in 2010-2011. We see more um, interprovincial employees, um, or fewer I should say, interprovincial employees um, in 2015-16 as compared to 2010-11. And here's an important distinction too. Um, you see that there's two sets of interprovincial employees in both time periods. One is, it says it's in, so that's including those people that move between Gatineau, Quebec and Ottawa. So those daily commuters across the border. The excluding excludes those migrants. And so it focuses more, this excluded one focuses more on truly long distance type of migrations. They're, when we cross or when they cross a provincial boundary, they're making a longer term movement. And so in that case, when we exclude them, the numbers of interprovincial employees actually increased uh, in that five year interval or appeared to increase. Classic way of taking a look at their characterization is to take a look at the age schedule of migration. And there's a bunch of different ones here. Um, the first one that I'll take a look at or talk about is this green one. Um, so this green age schedule of migration, just to show that it's sort of the classic age schedule of migration, low migration rates in the young teens. It peaks, that labor force peak into the 20s, and then a decline in the migration rates uh, over the intervening ages. So those, the older adults, less likely to migrate. Um, the purple one here, interprovincial inter migrants again, um, but just focused on those in the labor force. So this, that green one included everybody making an interprovincial migration. The purple is just on those employees, so a more pronounced labor force peak. And then we have two interprovincial employee lines. The blue here includes um, people moving across the border, provincial borders, regardless of distance, so including short-term um, daily commuters, and the red one, um, only those long-distance um, commuters or, or employees. Um, so, you know, the, again, they sort of follow the age schedule uh, with a little bit of a peak um, in the young labor force here, but then what's characteristic is that it's pretty consistent, you know, that the migration schedule's 
decline with age, employee schedules stay uh, pretty consistent over age groups. Um, so that's a, you know, a difference then between interprovincial employees and migrants. Uh, they tend to maintain higher rates of movement um, with age. Um, just sort of a, a close up of age schedules in, for interprovincial employees in both 2011 and 2016. Um, and again, whether it's including, so the, this upper set of lines, including those daily movers and uh, the purple and green here, excluding uh, those daily movers, but both census years. Um, and there's really, you know, no difference from a year perspective in terms of the rates of interprovincial employment uh, movement. They're really consistent, really tight in terms of following that. So in other words, in 2016, you're into that downturn in the resource sector, and yet it doesn't really have an impact in terms of uh, the rates of movement for interprovincial employees. Um, <clears throat> here's an example. So it's, it's um, still at the provincial level and uh, the in and out migration rates and net migration uh, over um, 2010, 11 and 2015, 16. So, you know, just in terms of out migration, here's, this is Newfoundland and Labrador, and this is a province that's out on the eastern edge of uh, Canada. And so it's consistently sent or has um, high out migration rate. And here's um, Alberta, that oil producing province, it has a low out migration rate, but a high in migration rate. So it's attractive to interprovincial employees. Um, so is uh, Saskatchewan, again, a resource sector type of uh, province. And we tend to see um, you know, higher out migration rates in these Eastern provinces. So typically higher out migration rates in the Eastern provinces and higher in migration rates in the Western provinces. And this is just sort of arranged in a rough um, geographic order from Eastern Canada to uh, Western Canada and on the Pacific Ocean here. But what's interesting is that, um, you know, the, the rates echoing those age schedule don't really change. And in fact, it just increases slightly. It's not statistically significant, but the rates of migration for interprovincial employees really consistent between 2010-11, <coughs> excuse me, and 2015-16. Um, net migration, so the difference between the number of people moving in and the number of people moving out of a region. So here's Alberta, for example, it has a huge draw uh, in terms of the number of migrants coming in in 2010, 2011. And this big out migration from those eastern provinces uh, in the same time period. Um, and in fact, most provinces have a net loss of interprovincial employees, it's only Alberta and Manitoba, sort of right in the middle of the country, um, that have a small or some sort of positive uh, movement in uh, interprovincial employees. So I said a moment ago that the migration rates were really consistent, but here's where you can see the impact of that <clears throat> um, downturn in the resource sector. So big change in terms of the net number of migrants. So Newfoundland and Labrador went from sending um, over 5,500 net uh, interprovincial employees out um, to just you know 510. Alberta went from attracting over or 14,000 interprovincial employees to um, just over 3,000. Still the same geography, you know, out migration from these eastern provinces and some in-migration into some of the Western provinces and a few changes in terms of signs, but, but numbers are much smaller. And the efficiency, <clears throat> migration efficiency, which is really a measure of the directionality of migration flows. So how much migration flows are in one direction. And while they were, you know, some of the flows are very efficient you know, this is again, Newfoundland and it's sending flows, you know, it's really just out migration um, from Newfoundland and Alberta, it's really just in migration of, or that movement in of interprovincial employees in 2010-11. Um, the 
efficiency has really dropped off um, over uh, or five years later with the downturn in the resource sector. This is just taking a look at it from a slightly different scale. So instead of the provinces looking at regions or cities uh, within Canada, and this is just listing the top gainers. Um, and what's consistent here is the, the group that are the top gainers of interprovincial employees in 2010-11, 2015-16. There's some differences in terms of where they rank, um, but Wood Buffalo, Alberta, um, top gainer uh, in both cases. And what's so interesting or, or the, the significance of Wood Buffalo, this is Alberta. This is the home of the oil sands um, region. Fort McMurray uh, sits in this Wood Buffalo region in Northern Alberta. So that's why we see this big attraction. It actually increased um, in 2015-16. Um, Calgary, Edmonton, Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver, all cities. So you might expect them to see um, or be gainers just because of the size as, as employees move in there. And those could be people working in banks and they've you know, been given a different job in the banking or the, the law profession, but they're not investing in migration, but they're still going there. The other thing that stands out then is rural places like Alberta Rural. It's not a township, it's not a region, it's just a rural area or rural Ontario, rural BC, rural Saskatchewan. They're still gaining and a lot of that is um, the resource sector. 2015-16, um, um, you know, these are top gainers. Some of them actually, um, you know, in th and that's just in terms of the count in, but they do show up as being net gain. Um, they, they lost um, a net number of employees in that time period. So while they're top in terms of gainers, when we also consider that out migration, you see that they actually lost population. And the top senders, um, same periods, of course. And again, what stands out here um, is that a lot of the top senders are rural places. Um, so people looking for work, not a lot of, it's likely that there's not a lot of job opportunities in those rural locations. So they're forced to go to another province or another region um, outside of their province in order to earn their income. And again, big cities like Montreal, Vancouver as sending um, employees as well. Um, so that's sort of the descriptive part, multivariate um, results. And um, there's two different models that were estimated here. Uh, one uh, where the dependent variable is in whether or not an individual is an interprovincial employee or an interprovincial migrant. And then a series of independent variables that we'll talk about age, gender, marital status, education, occupation, industry, employment status, housing tenure, and language. Um, so I, I'm just sort of um, written this out rather than having the, the large um, results table of um, the regression, um, just to sort of spell out what some of these differences are. Males are like more likely to be either an interprovincial migrant or an interprovincial employee. Um, French speakers, because Canada um, you know, has two um, Two national languages uh, or official languages, French and English. Um, French speakers, if you're a French speaker, uh, or if you have children, you're less likely to migrate and less um, um, likely to be or engage in interprovincial employment. So it decreases the likelihood of both migration and employment type of moves. Again, that's pretty consistent. Uh, we see that French speakers consistently are less likely to move, especially out of province, um, out of the French speaking province of Quebec. And we know that families are less li likely to migrate because it starts to disrupt education um, the, and the adults are older. Um, 
we start to see some other subtle differences between employment movement and migration. Uh, so for marital status, for example, you're more likely to be an interprovincial employee if you're single, and you're um, more likely to be an interprovincial migrant if you're divorced, separated, or widowed, this DSW. Um, age, it, um, really inconsistent effect uh, by age for interprovincial employees, and that's probably, cap you know, that there's no trend um, or real trend thinking back to those graphs that showed the migration rates across age. There's really no trend uh, for interprovincial employees. But um, if you're a migrant, 20 to, if you're 20 to 24 year old, you're most likely to migrate. And then there's a decreasing likelihood of migration with increasing age, sort of catching that decline with age in terms of migration rates. Um, in terms of home ownership, you're less likely to migrate if you own a home. And uh, in terms of interprovincial employment, there's no effect of home ownership. Um, interprovincial migrants, are, our migration is more likely if you have higher education level. And in interprovincial employment, you're more likely if you're an apprentice. Um, you know, maybe it's a, an apprentice welder or an apprentice gas fitter or carpenter. Um, so you're more likely to engage in those types of moves. Um, industry, uh, and you're more likely to be in interprovincial employment if you work in industries related to oil, gas, mining, and transportation and construction. And you're more likely to be an interprovincial employee if you're uh, in occupations that include trade and transport and resources. And you're more likely to be a migrant if you're in education, law and government, or health. So you know, really where some of these differences in terms of who's making the decision to make a migration versus an employment move, those, you know, shorter term employment type of moves um, depends in part on the industry and the occupation uh, that you're in. Um, give you, I wanted to give you a sense of, you know, the magnitude of, um, the, the potential for income transfer um, across provinces. And if we just look at 2010, 2011, uh, interprovincial employees were responsible for the movement of nearly $4 billion in 2010. So again, working in one province, residing in another, and a, a, some of that income is going to go home. Um, before I get into this, you know, I'll say that there's an important pause here in that the in income that I'm reporting is their total income, their total earned income. It doesn't account for costs associated with transportation to and from work, for example, if they have to pay for that. It doesn't account for their um, accommodation and food in the places where they're working. So thinking back to that person that I was sitting on the plane with, when he got to Fort McMurray, he has to pay or often or may have to pay accommodation. He may have to pay for his food. And I'm not accounting for that. This is just their total income. And I'm assuming that all of that income is going to go home, is going to be spent, sent back home to them. And it would be impossible really to, to estimate how much income stays in the place where they work versus how much income goes home because there's very different models of these employees. In some cases, the employer pays for their transportation to the work sites, um, so airfare, anything like that. Employers may also pay for their accommodation and may pay for their food. And in other cases, uh, it's the worker that has to pay for accommodation and food, but then a worker might be sharing an apartment with four other workers, for example. Uh, so we don't have information in terms of, um, you know, what the, their employer paid versus what they have to pay. So as I said, we're really talking about the total, just saying, if a person earned $100,000 working in Alberta, that, that $100,000 went or was sent back home with them. Um, so the table that you see here is 
um, reflecting um, the per capita income of interprovincial employees um, in 2010. And you can see at the bottom here that interprovincial employees earned more than those who stayed uh, by about uh, $5,000 or so more. Um, this column here is exported versus uh, imported into their province of residence. So if you were working in Alberta, you typically exported some $67,000 back home. Um, and, or if you were working in Newfoundland, you exported almost $56,000 and you brought home, um, you know, if, if you resided in Newfoundland, you were bringing home $51,000. And so you're substantially better off than somebody who stayed uh, in Newfoundland. The exception here is Prince Edward Island. It's a very small province uh, located in the Gulf of St. Lawrence um, that if you came back, you were importing about $35,000, which was actually less than um, what you would have earned as a stayer. This may reflect um, that it's not just to max, people are move, doing interprovincial employment, not just to maximize their income, but to have an income um, with limited employment opportunities, uh, potentially in Prince Edward Island. Um, so, so you can see some of the effects here. Um, again, you know, you're typically better off um, in terms of income relative to those who stayed. Um, this is sort of another way of uh, looking at that transfer of income um, and, and people. So this net migration, we saw these numbers in an earlier table, you know, Alberta gaining 14,000 people, Newfoundland and Labrador sending some 5,000 people net. Um, here's the net income migration. So this is really just saying in total, how much income was gained or lost in the province? This is in thousands of dollars. So Newfoundland, for example, had a huge gain in terms of, into, you know, this is aggregating up all of the income coming in um, to the province, this huge gain of, uh, you know, some $316 million in Alberta. That's where you see, you know, people, we know people come into work and then they're shift, shifting or shipping that income back home and a net loss of some $885 million out of the province and going elsewhere. Demographic effectiveness, we saw this earlier too as, as well. Um, so, you know, how unidirectional that flow is. So while Newfoundland, a lot of that flow is going out. If we look at income effectiveness and it's defined the same way, but just with a dollar value, um, we see that Newfoundland really, you know, that, that income stream into the province was almost one way, you know, 66% um, effective. And here's Alberta, you know, it's unidirectional into the province in terms of workers, but, um, you know, pretty effective at negative 45 um, out of the province. Um, so again, it's, it's reflecting that big shift out. There's some income, come, so it's, there's some income coming in, you know, not when we look at Alberta, that net. So of course, there's more than 14,000 people coming in, but Alberta is also sending workers to other provinces. Um, so in the same way, it's sending um, income to other provinces and it's gaining income. Um, but overall, it's a net loss and a fairly effective uh, net loss of income. Um, this is um, taking a look at the type or the typology of migration. And this is following um, a procedure or process that David Plain at University of Arizona did. Um, and he did some similar work in terms of um, in the shift of income across space. Um, and it's really just to say, you know, is the shift of income largely because of the volume of migration or is it because of some characteristics of the migrants? And in each case, it's the, the volume of migration that's driving that income shift and not the characteristics of uh, migrants. 
Um, I'm thinking I'm running out of time here. I see Juan back on. Um, no, okay, okay. Um, again, just going from the provincial scale down to that regional scale here to give you a sense. So here's Wood Buffalo again, that Fort McMurray, the center of oil sands. That's the place that's exporting um, a huge amount of income. That's the total exported, the amount per capita. Um, uh, that's exported from that place of work. Now, relative to stayers, people who live in Fort McMurray and don't move, it's less. Um, but for a person taking that home, they're, they're gaining a lot. And here's that um, demographic effectiveness. One way, it's that movement into Wood Buffalo is one way, and the income is one way out and, and going home um, there. Um, and then you also see these rural areas um, that are, you know, big senders in terms of the total amount, um, in terms of the, the per capita and, you know, some of the migration efficiencies. Um, Wood Buffalo, you know, has a very high um, income level um, so that, you know, for a stayer there, they they are really sort of reaping the benefits, but the, the, the flip side is, um, you know, a cup, cup of coffee, if I bought a cup of coffee here, it's going to be $2. Um, that same cup of coffee is going to be much more uh, in Wood Buffalo because the employment costs are much higher there. Um, these are the importing regions. Um, so here's where you can see the benefit, you know, that if you lived in rural Newfoundland, you're bringing home a salary of something like $50,000 in comparison to um, a salary for stayers of about $38,000. Um, rural Ontario, you're, the income you're importing is some $51,000 compared to $43,000 and so on. So, um, you know, people who engage in interprovincial employment have higher per capita incomes than those who stay. Um, so it's a, you know, people are engaging in this for uh, their income benefit. They see the need for filling jobs and they're responding to that and then benefiting from um, a, a higher salary or higher income. And then, you know, measures of net migration, demographic effectiveness and income effectiveness. Um, you know, rural Newfoundland, <clears throat> you're really, that's, it's really a place that is sending people out in search of employment, but that income is unidirectional back into uh, the province. A place like, um, you know, Montreal, um, you know, as a city, person engaged in a provincial employment is still gaining in terms of income is in comparison to somebody who stayed, but that migration effectiveness and the income effectiveness are much smaller, um, not surprisingly, um, because of, you know, that flow in and out of Montreal isn't just one way. So just a few things to wrap up here. Um, so interprovincial employees represent a significant part of Canada's labor force. Um, they certainly appear to respond to labor market signals like employment opportunities or income, um, like an interprovincial migrant, and they're reducing labor shortages. So, you know, as um, where labor shortages or labor needs appear, these interprovincial employees move um, or shift to fill those. Um, they're Interprovincial employees represent a larger absolute number than interprovincial migrants. And in many ways, in terms of their characteristics, they're similar to interprovincial migrants, but there are these subtle differences in terms of age, in terms of the educational profile, in terms of occupation, and in terms of industry. Those interprovincial employees are, like we saw, more likely to be in construction or mining and quarrying and gas sector or in transportation, uh, for example. Migrants tend more to be uh, highly educated working in the healthcare sector, for example. Um, so it's unlikely that there's 
with, with interprovincial employment movement, it's unlikely that there's going to be a long-term shift in human capital. There really seem to be sort of filling the immediate job needs, but not staying, you know, that we're not going to see an extended uh, shift in terms of human capital. Um, <clears throat> the movement of income by interprovincial employees is, is not insignificant. So there's large volumes exported from places that hosted a large number of interprovincial employees. Um, oftentimes these are rural or resource locations like rural Alberta or Fort McMurray, that wood buffalo. Um, and the source locations like the Atlantic provinces uh, or rural areas um, benefited from the net inflow of income by interprovincial employees. So they were coming back with higher uh, per capita income than stayers typically. Um, there's also evidence that the decision to work outside the province of residence is driven in part by the availability of jobs along with the skills required in the position and the skills embodied um, in the worker both in the province and elsewhere. And finally, uh, the movement of income was predominantly associated with the volume of employee movement as opposed to differential income effects of interprovincial employees. So it's, 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 as I said, it's just the sheer number of interprovincial employees um, that are responsible for that movement of income, as opposed to differences in terms of education or occupation uh, or some characteristics of employees um, that's driving it. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, and uh, thank you very much for uh, your attention. Okay, thanks, Ruth. Uh, uh, we open for questions. Uh, I would begin with uh, initial comment relatable to my source of interest. Uh, in these topics and in this associated with the, well, right now I've been working with the boom and bust uh, cases in the US and um, well, the boom and bust cases bring a lot of uh, work, attract a lot of workers, but they are short term uh, period of work, uh, but they create some environment that can be slightly hostile with the, well, given the, the quickness and the not exactly well-planned development that has been going on. Uh, I think that basically on your, on your results, you have a more planned development and, and a more uh, sustainable uh, resource extraction there. Uh, could be this part of the reason why this is the is, is part of what is happening or or not or more I see well what I mean is uh of us is just one time just frack everything and just leave <laughs> here we see uh, more uh, sustainable uh, more sustainable effect in some of the regions. I think. Well, that's what I feel in some of the data I see from, from the recruitment there. Yeah, it's, I, I, I don't know if we'd characterize it um, as more sustainable over um, the long term. Um, you know, there's certainly questions raised around whether or not um this is something you know the development of the oil sands in northern alberta is something that should continue or proceed um and and what it means to the environment um it had i think you know the its growth really sort of reflected a long-term need and investment um by the Canadian government and by other, you know, industrial partners um, that saw um, the oil sands grow as a, a source of oil and natural gas, but it, it comes with um, 
some significant environmental problems. Um, and you sort of hinted at, um, you know, there's on the ground, uh, there have been some significant social um, and economic issues uh, in places like Fort McMurray, um, where, you know, cost of living is high, cost of housing is high. Um, and, you know, one, it's sort of a, a social aspect of this movement of employees is that they're not embedded or they're not participating. They don't have ownership in the local community. Um, so it's created a friction between the people who live there permanently and, and these people who um, move in and out. Um, so yeah, I, I guess, I, 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 as I said, I wouldn't characterize it as sustainable and you know, we've, we've certainly seen um, probably since about 2016 that um, the investment in um, the oil sands or technology there has really decreased. You know, I think, you know, when I, when I was giving the presentation, I said, oh, look, you know, the, the numbers have changed, but the migration rates haven't really changed all that much. And Alberta is still a big draw. Um, you know, it's bringing a lot, still a lot of people in. I think part of that is that with the, when the oil prices crashed in 2014, there was still a lot of building and investment that was ongoing that needed to be completed. And it was probably maybe 2016, 2017, where you really started to see, um, you know, the impact or, um, you know, less need for people going out there to work um, or to, you know, to just sort of moving in and out of the community. Um, it hasn't, um, they haven't continued to invest in new development um, there. Part of it, you mentioned fracking. Um, it's, it's the cost of getting the oil out of the ground in comparison to fracking. Um, it's, it's much more expensive and, um, to produce oil out of the oil sands um, than it is in uh, in the case of fracking, but that's just sort of one part of the interprovincial employee movement. That it's it's not you know there's a, it's a huge part, uh, but there's people moving into other places and other resources as well. Uh, I I got a question on the chat. Uh, yes, uh, you can. Uh, one, quick, one person asked me if they can ask something. Yes, yeah. if you want to ask or I can translate it. I already received one question. Uh, are there any policies to uh, incentivize or promote uh, economically IPM or by the government or by the local or regional states, regional government? Um, no, uh, there's not. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's an interesting question because um, you know, I've, I've there, there's no incentive from the government for to get people to move across um, the country or to move in terms of search of jobs. Um, and in fact, there's some concerns that people are less likely to to move or to migrate because uh, they can have unemployment insurance, uh, for example. Um, or, or things that will keep, there, there's policies that keep them in place um, so that they, you know, if they lose a job, that there's no incentive or no push um, by the government um, to get them to move to another location. Um, and, and that's, it is something that parts of the government or, you know, policy groups have said, you know, we, we need to try to encourage that migration through incentives, but we've never done that. There's one person asking me if they can ask question, of course. You want to go ahead or do you want to see? Okay. I, I can't do it. Uh, okay. uh, good morning, Professor Bruce. Uh, I, I got a question. Uh, in this moment, I'm in Halifax, uh, Nova Scotia. Um, uh, it, firstly, I was interested in, in this presentation. The IP or the, the population that is migrant, there are foreign migrants or there are uh, people who born in Canada? 
Yeah, good question. I didn't state that. These would be um, both foreign immigrants as well as people born in Canada. Um, you know, as long as say um, they had a, they lived, they were in Canada in 2010 and then also in Canada in 2011 or 2015, 16. Um, so it's, it's either, you know, people born in Canada or the foreign born. Uh, yes, because I was thinking some of variables of interest that uh, immigrants that they take in account to, to move to another province is firstly uh, the language or the population of uh, they are from uh, the countries. And the second one is the laws that, uh, the laws that uh, they are in favor of that people. For example, here in Nova Scotia, I know that there is some favorable laws that they had to the immigrant for other countries to come here um, because they pay less taxes, they have more jobs opportunities for the people who are from other countries. So I think this, these variables are interesting to, to take in mind. Yeah, no, it's, that, that's a really good point. Um, you know, in terms of the, the movement amongst immigrants across the country, um, you know, are different um, than those of uh, people born in Canada. Uh, you know, that, as you say, you know, language or the presence of, um, you know, immigrant groups um, like themselves, uh, those are big draws. And, and a place like Nova Scotia, you've probably seen, um, they, they tend to have a hard time holding on to uh, the immigrants into the province that people come and then they, they often, you know, move on to um, Ontario or Alberta or British Columbia or somewhere um, after, they, after a relatively short period of time. Uh, yes, and, and the the unemployment rates in in Alberta it could be explained because they dropped some prices on oil about five years ago. Because I was reading that this one of the most richest provinces there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And with that drop in oil prices, you know that's what we thought would would really sort of decrease the number of of migrants and employees and and and. Um, and I think it, it has that if you were to take a look at the numbers now, um, why not just think, but you know, if you take a look at the estimates that Statistics Canada publishes, um, the number of migrants going to Alberta has certainly declined um, with uh, the drop in oil prices. Okay, good, good. Oh, the, the other thing, the other variable, I think maybe the weather, because it, when sometimes the people is thinking, okay, we are going to move, and there are provinces that they are really cold. We don't want to move these kind of, of things. Yeah, yeah. And I, I don't, didn't have weather in these um, or, or climate in uh, these estimations, but uh, you know, in other work that I've done, you certainly see the impact. Um, you know, if, if people have an opportunity, they're going to go to a warmer place. Keeping in mind it's Canada, um, you know, so, um, you know, our, our warmest province is sort of British Columbia and Vancouver. Um, and and it's, it's certainly not, um, you know, the heat of, of Columbia or, or, you know, if you, we made comparisons to the United States, um, you know, it's not the Southwest or, or Florida, for example. So it's, but it, it's surprisingly, it's still, you know, this climate or weather still does factor into people's choices of, of where to move to. Uh, in in Canada, yes, for sure. I'm 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 thinking to move it. I'm thinking to move the warmest province. <laughs> <laughs> Just watch out for the rain if you're going to BC. <laughs> yes, thank you, Professor. You're welcome. Question. I think.